This morning's scripture reading is Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. There, thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Just a reminder, all parents with younger kids uh, should have gotten an email. Uh, we have an advent calendar for you. Uh, Jim McLeod is handing them out there in the hallway there. And every year we do this, um, we always have people who don't have kids who are like, what about us? Um, and so if you look on this table right outside the door there, we have a Christmas devotional uh, by, by, by Paul Tripp for you. So that's available for anyone, um, even you with little kids, you can take these. So they're on the table outside right there for you to collect. Again, in our ongoing desire to help you uh, become disciples in life, just take this and help it be a devotional time for you during Advent. And parents, make sure to grab your Advent calendar for the kids. We are looking at Psalm 122. We're just doing three weeks on, Psalm, on the Psalms. And these are Psalms of Ascent. Your people are headed up to Jerusalem. And uh, the question I'm going to ask is, have any of you ever been let, let down by a destination? Uh, you go somewhere and it's not at all what you thought it was going to be. A few years ago, our family, I won't say which, which uh, theme park, but we were going to a theme park. And uh, when we got there, the theme park had grossly underestimated how many people were coming that day. And it was such a bad experience, we ended up leaving early. Um, these are pilgrims headed to Jerusalem. Pilgrims are people on a spiritual journey. And so the, the question I want to pose for all of us this morning uh, is, uh, is the journey worth it for you? Uh, Christ is calling us, we are calling you to go on a pilgrimage to follow Christ. And what you're going to have to ask yourself at the end of the day and before you even start the journey is, is it worth doing this? So what I want to do is uh, look at Psalm 122, and we're going to have three ways to help you become a pilgrim without the belt buckle hats. Um, three ways to be a pilgrim today on a spiritual journey towards Christ. Uh, before we go any further, please pray with me. Father, thank you for this morning. And we ask that we would send the Spirit to work in the hearts of everyone here. We pray for all of our children. Lord, I'm especially are thankful for Franklin being born. We pray that all of them would grow up knowing you. Pray for any adult children or adults who have wandered away. Spirit, that you would draw them back. And we pray that you'd send the Spirit to work in our hearts now, that through your word we would die to sin and become more alive to you. Father, we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So when the pilgrims came to America, Hebrews eleven thirteen talks about being uh, travelers, being aliens, being uh, on a pilgrimage in this life. And that's what led them there. And so that's no different than how people felt going to Jerusalem. Now, why this uh, understanding, why, why we want to, this idea of what it means to be a pilgrim or three ways to be a pilgrim in this life is so important is that right now, um, there, there's some trends, especially in uh, Western Christianity, especially in our branch, which we call evangelical Christianity, uh, which are, are showing some signs that are, that are kind of not great. Um, uh, Kerry Newalf, who's a pastor, and now he, has, he does research, talked about how right now, so evangelical is you have all the Christian denominations, and evangelicals are the ones who kind of said, you know what, personal faith, God's word is really important to us. No, there's nothing political related to it at all. Um, even just what evangelical comes from, that you, you really believe that having a personal faith in Jesus Christ is essential, and you love his word. What they're finding out that right now is that right now in, in America, or North America, that there are more evangelicals who have stopped going to church than there are of um, the denominations where no one left, right? So we have the denominations, all the all Christian denominations, people left and, and were the evangelicals. We have all the evangelical denominations. There's more evangelicals who have stopped going to church, stopped worshiping, than 
this other group who are still going. And he talked about the research is showing there's three big reasons why um, this might happen. Uh, the first is relevance, that many people, when they come to church, they leave saying, that didn't apply to me at all. That wasn't relevant to me at all. And when I hear that, um, I would argue that the problem is probably not the church. The problem is probably a misunderstanding of what it means to be a disciple. Relevancy is on you. Your job is to take God's word and say, how is this relevant? And apply it to your life. To wrestle with it becoming relevant. Your job is to understand how it's relevant. Our job as a preacher is to point it out to you, but your job is to dig in with it. Is that happening? The next one is affluency. And they talk about how, again, as, as uh, especially Western, the Western world um, is becoming more affluent, that, that people are just finding better ways to entertain themselves. There's just better things to do. And that's important I use the word entertainment because what's happened is uh, people are coming to church saying, entertain me. And if you aren't entertained well, then you're like, I can go and do something else better. I have the resources to do that now. And the problem with that thinking is theologically, believe it or not, we're not here. Everyone on the stage on a Sunday isn't here to entertain you. Ready for this mind bender? You're here to entertain God. Theologically speaking, biblically speaking, you're the ones who are entertaining God. Not us up here. Not me, but you. God is looking down and observing you wanting to be entertained by what your heart and what your mind is doing right now. He wants to know, does, does the gospel, does the message of Christ mean anything to you? What is going on in your heart and mind? And lastly, his last point that I talked about is uh, directed spirituality, uh, which means basically faith by YouTube, that many people right now, in a good way, you can explore and learn things on your own, but so many people are think, thinking, I can just do this on my own without the church in my life. And again, that leads to a very shallow, bad understanding of faith. But what we believe, this is the problem. And this is why, and again, and I've talked to many people, and you're thinking, you're like, you're in this room right now, and you're saying, that's, that's for the people who aren't in this room, right? That's for all the people I mentioned that aren't going. Well, to you, I say the same thing I say when I'm doing marriage counseling. And at the end, I always ask the couple, uh, what do you think about divorce? And usually I get the, I don't believe in it, I don't even use that word. And I say, that probably means you're at greater risk for it then, right? For those who don't think they are under attack are probably more at risk to being under attack. The many people I've talked to who comes from the evangelical world who stopped going to church, they didn't, they didn't wake up one morning and they just turned the light off and said, I don't want to do it. They described it mostly as somewhere along the way, the light started getting dim and it just slowly kept getting dimmer. And it kept getting dimmer until one day there was no light and they just don't feel the need to go anymore. This is why this psalm is so important because you might be thinking right now, that's not where I am, but it could be. And for some of you might be thinking, actually, that's exactly where I am. Well, hopefully this psalm will help you as well. So Psalm verses one and two. So the pilgrims are making, we think David might have written this psalm. So they're going, and this is what the psalmist said. So we're going to have three ways, again, to help you be a pilgrim here. The first one is to give thanks. The first one is to give thanks. Three ways to be a pilgrim in this life. The first one is to give thanks. So here's the verse. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our freedom and standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. So what the psalmist, and we were here the last couple of weeks, that the journey was kind of long, kind of dangerous, kind of hard. And the psalmist is saying, I am so glad that somebody asked me to go. Now, for some of you love restaurants and you're just waiting for someone to ask you to go. And when everyone asks you to that restaurant, you will go. We don't know if the psalmist was saying, anytime anyone asks me to go to Jerusalem, it's a good day. Or if the psalmist was saying, you know what? I didn't realize how good it was. And I'm so glad someone asked me. But the psalmist is saying, I am so thrilled. I'm so glad that someone said, let's go to Jerusalem. Let's go to the house of the Lord. And not only that, Verse 2 is telling us that not only was the journey, he's now there. He stepped into the gates. He's in Jerusalem, and he's saying, I cannot believe it. We, we came, I'm standing here, and it was all worth it. I'm so glad we did this. At the end of the day, at the end of life, 
What we want most for every believer, every follower of Christ, is for you able to say, it was so worth it. I am so glad I made this pilgrimage. I'm so glad I made this journey. But this is what he's saying again, to give thanks. I am so glad. He said, let us go to the house of our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Again, what we want to do, what do we are to do then when we come to church? Again, those three things that we talked about, why, what's kind of messing up our understanding of worship. Again, you're not coming to take, you're coming to give. Now, for those who don't know Christ, you're hopefully coming to learn. But if you're a follower of Christ, you're not coming here to be entertained. What you're coming here to do is to give. To give what? Thanks. You're coming here to give thanks. God is looking to be entertained by your hearts and your minds. He's looking to see how are you giving thanks? What are you giving thanks for? Our catechism tells us that we're, we come to church to magnify God's name, to make him great. So what we do when we come here, hopefully the worship service from the music, the confession, the sermon, everything that's happening, even the people around you, it's revealing to your heart that, you know what? God has become small and irrelevant in certain places in my life. And worship is supposed to make that magnify, to help you remember how great he is. But you're coming to give thanks. That is what we do. So first thing to do as a pilgrim is to learn to come to give thanks. Learn what it is you are thankful for. Learn what Christ has done for us on the cross, that he has died for you. He has saved you. And that's something that will never change. So we go from giving thanks to the next one is to remember. So how to be like a pilgrim here? To give thanks along the journey, along the way to learn to give thanks. Next is to learn to remember. Verses three to five. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Their thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Now again, understanding why we come to church, what we're coming here to do, how to be a pilgrim. I remember uh, kind of a funny story. So back when I was a senior in high school, uh, I'd only been a Christian just like one or two years, and I thought it'd be fun to teach third grade Sunday school. Uh, and Sunday school, as you know, it's where you come to learn about faith and, and a, whatever level of where you're at. So third graders, I was teaching the third grade class. It was partially just to kind of learn the stories myself. And at the end of the first day, we gave all the parents a little note saying, what are you here for? What, what is your reason? What are you hoping to get out of the Sunday school class? And then the next week, we got the cards back and read what everyone put. And one mom had put, uh, well, you know, there were things like, you know, I hope, my, I hope my child will learn how to pray better. I hope my child will learn how to read the Bible, understand the Bible, understand faith. But one mom put, um, I would like for my child to understand the mathematic tables better. And I was like, what? <laughs> that's, that's not why we're here. That's not what we're about. And again, so the question you have to pose is, what is worship? Why are you here? Are you like that parent who is utterly confused about what was going on? Or do you know why you're here? Again, so as pilgrims in life, we are to give thanks. We are to remember. And so put the verses back up. So uh, why we think this might have been David is that. So what David's seeing here in the city is he's seeing a city that's functioning like it should. I, I was born in the district I grew up around here, and every time, uh, and some of you might, I know we, we don't like traffic. Um, Northern Virginians like to brag about how bad our traffic is, but we, we, we have the Tyson's Corner area, and I go back far enough that I remember when it wasn't, there wasn't, there wasn't as much there as there is, there is now. Go way back. And every time I go through Tyson's Corner, I'm in awe of how much it's developed and changed from being nothing like it is now to a, a, a city. David is saying the same thing about Jerusalem. Now, again, Jerusalem was where everything happened. Jerusalem is where you came as a people, and in the middle of Jerusalem was the temple, and inside the temple was the presence of God. Jerusalem was everything. And David is saying, he's looking around, he's saying, look, people are, are coming together and, and moving up to the courts. They're coming to worship. They're finding judgment. They're finding justice. They're, everything's happening here. Like, the city is working. Why is that so important to David? Because he's saying he remembered when there was no city and they were traveling around in tents. 
There was no house for the Lord. There was no temple dwelling. He was dwelling in a tent. And now David's saying, he's just walking. We think it's David, whoever the psalmist is saying, just remembering like, look at this. Look what's happening here. Look what's happened. This city has become a place for God to dwell and, and people are coming to worship. And again, the, the temple had these courts and the courts let you know how close you could get to God. So in the inner, the inner place was the priest, only the priest could go there. And then outside of that was the court of men. And outside was the court of everybody. There was another temple that was built later when this one was destroyed and they added a court of women as well. But you had these courts that let you know you could come and, and you could almost get close to God. You couldn't get quite close enough, but you knew he was there. And David's looking around saying, this is amazing. Look at what it was and look at what Jerusalem is now. It's a city with walls and gates. And most importantly, there's a temple inside of it where we can worship. Tim Keller says, the center of the Bible is the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ. And at the center of the gospel is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, in the same way, when you were to look at Jerusalem, at the center of Jerusalem was the temple, and inside the temple was the Holy of Holies, the place where the presence of the Lord is. A pilgrim gives thanks, learns to give thanks for all that Christ has done. We must also learn to remember all that God has done in our lives. What I mean by that is this. You don't just remember what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. What I want you guys to do is to learn to remember what Jesus did in your life yesterday. Remember when Thanksgiving coming, coming up in a couple days, um, I remember when I was a teenager, the, the dreaded question was about to happen, right? Everyone's sitting around the Thanksgiving table and everyone had to answer the question, right? What are we thankful for, right? As I'm older now, I love that part, but I can remember as a teenager, even after teenagers, just like I was loathing that part. I was like, who cares about this part? No one even cares about this part. Come on, skip to the food, right? <laughs> but there are some people who are excited about what they prepared little, little write-ups to talk about what they're thankful for. Well, when we're talking about learning to remember, we need to do the same. We need to not be the people who are coming to Thanksgiving with nothing to give thanks or nothing to remember what God has done. As a follower of Christ, we want you to learn to remember all that Christ has done and that he's doing now. Remember, Christ didn't just die for you 2,000 years ago. He's working grace into your life right now. That's what a pilgrim remembers. We give thanks. We remember. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? One of the amazing things that Christ does. Again, so what the Jerusalem represented to the psalmist. So you had this temple. You had the thing in the middle. You were going there. Well, one of the most amazing things that Christ does at his resurrection is no longer is Jerusalem or the temple a destination point. Taurus, sure. But when it comes to salvation, when it comes to the presence of God, the temple has come to us. That's what Jesus has done. That means you don't have to go anywhere to find God. He comes and finds you. That's what our theology, that's what our Bible teaches us. God comes to find you. That's what he's doing. And lastly, verse 6 to 9. Pray for peace, Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls, security within your towers. For my brothers and companions, say, I will say, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek your good. The word peace here means shalom. Hopefully you've heard that word before. Jerusalem means the city of peace. Shalom is talking about a peace that's not just peace from wars, but it's a peace from God working in your soul. It's an eternal, internal peace that you have. And the psalmist is saying, this is the city of peace. This is where we find peace. We want to pray for everyone to know this peace. When we talk about, again, I mentioned a lot today, our, our mission statement, disciples in life, disciples in community, discipling Northern Virginia. This is what we want to see happen. We want to see people finding the peace that only comes from knowing Christ. Philippians 4, 7 says it really well. When we're talking about peace, it doesn't mean happy. It doesn't mean that you're happy all the time. Peace means that you understand God is with you 
all the time. So when horrible things happen, you have a peace. Remember, the scripture doesn't say you're not allowed to be frustrated. You're not allowed to struggle. You're not allowed to be angry. The scripture doesn't say that. What it does say, though, is that you need to know the peace of God in all of those things. Paul's talking about, the apostle Paul's talking about peace. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. There is a peace that comes from knowing Jesus Christ that surpasses everything. On your highest or your lowest or your worst of days, if you know the peace of Christ, it endures. And this is what the psalmist wants us to have, wants everyone to have, the peace of Christ. So as we're pilgrims on a spiritual journey towards Jerusalem, our Jerusalem is not physical, our Jerusalem is spiritual. We need to learn why and how we give thanks. We need to learn how and why it's important to remember how God is working now, and we need to remember what God's peace is. We talked about how, because of Christ, now the temple comes to you. When, in the end of Revelation, when they're talking about what it's going to be like, is it worth this journey? Is it worth being a pilgrim? Is it worth going on this adventure? Well, in Revelation, we get a vision of what it's like at the end of our spiritual journey for those who put their faith in following Christ, who become disciples in following Christ. It's described as a new Jerusalem. Heaven's described as a new Jerusalem. Jerusalem. The question being asked, is it worth it? What Revelation teaches us, what Psalm 122 teaches us, is that the answer is emphatically yes. It is worth being a pilgrim. It is worth someone being on a spiritual journey to go wherever Christ leads. Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, will exceed all expectations worth every moment of your pilgrimage. And just like the Israelites traveling to Jerusalem, our worship today, what we're doing now, is the same thing. This is a part of our pilgrimage to New Jerusalem. So right now, God is calling on you to be a follower of him, to be a disciple, to be a disciple who gives thanks to be a disciple who remembers and to be a disciple who is seeking peace. The peace that only comes from knowing Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending your son that we would know peace. Lord, we thank you for sending your son that we would have many things to remember that realize that you are working in our lives all the time. And Lord, thank you for sending your son that we will always, on our worst of days, have something to give thanks for. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Please stand for our final song.